Good morning. Good morning and welcome to worship this morning at First Baptist Church. I would like to welcome those of you who might be joining us online. We are glad that you're here also. If anyone may be visiting us this morning, we are also glad that you're joining us. And uh, if you are visiting on the back of our bulletin, you'll see a little uh, area where you can fill out some information. And, um, and if you look real closely, that's perforated, so you can fold that and tear it out and turn it in to, uh, to us at the end of the service by dropping it into the offering plate. And we would love for you to do that if you're visiting so we can follow up with you and see how we may be able to minister to you and to your family. I'd like to make you aware of several of the announcements and things that are going on in the life of our church. So if you do have a bulletin, please look at it. Uh, first of all, it, during the month of May, and May ends tomorrow, uh, we have been collecting a love offering for Wesley Memorial United Methodist Church. They experienced a fire uh, several months back and they are in the rebuilding process. Today is the last day to give, although if you want to give afterwards, we, we won't turn it away, but uh, for the collection, today is the last day. Uh, please place love offering on the memo of checks, or if you're going to turn uh, give through an envelope, make sure that you write love offering on there, and, uh, and they can be turned in um, in the offering plates that are located here at the front of the sanctuary. Remember that the first $1,000 that is given will also be matched by the H.D. Johnson Fund. And do remember that uh, if you want to give tithes and offerings right now, we aren't passing the plate still. So you can come to the front and you can place those at the end of the service. Also, you can drop off at any time during office hours in the office or mail checks to the church office. Next Sunday, June the 6th, is our graduate recognition service. Chris Tomlin will be bringing the message for our graduates, and we hope that you'll be here as we celebrate the accomplishments of the several graduates we have, uh, both from the high school and college levels. Remember that Vacation Bible School is coming very soon. It'll be starting two weeks from tomorrow on June the 14th. It's three nights, June 14th through 16th, and it'll be at uh, the Presbyterian Church. If you have not signed up yet, please see Holly Sloan, our minister with families and children. This morning I would like to, uh, to, to ask you to add a name, a person to our prayer list. You can see on the back of the bulletin our current prayer list and the individuals that are being prayed for. Um, Mr. Alex Corbett would like to be added to the prayer list. He has an outpatient procedure this week and would covet our prayers as we lift our brother in Christ up um, for that. Um, lastly, tomorrow is uh, Memorial Day, and so the church office will be closed. So if you need anything, you might have to wait till Tuesday. Um, but as we gather this morning, we, uh, in, in recognizing that, tomor that tomorrow is Memorial Day, we gather recognizing those people who've paid the ultimate sacrifices in losing their lives, laying their lives down uh, for others so that we might have the freedom that we're able to walk in. Jesus said that greater love has no, no one than this, that, than that someone lay down their lives for their friends. So if you're a person this morning who's been affected by the loss of a loved one in service, um, we grieve with you. We also celebrate their life with you. We appreciate you and the ways that you have also sacrificed in losing a loved one. And um, we surely do remember those, those people who have been lost. With that in mind, let's join our hearts as we seek God together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence here this morning. We thank you for your presence always. God, as we gather on this Sunday to worship you, we, we recognize that you're with us in a very special way as we gather together. We're thankful that you're continuing to bring about your work in our church and in this Farmville community and amongst all the churches here. God, we thank you that we're participating in your kingdom coming on this earth all over the globe as churches uh, continue to be uh, part of your body, your global kingdom. God, we thank you that one day we're going to be in a, in a place where there's no more uh, crying, mourning, death, pain. All those things will be passed away. And God, we, we recognize though that we, we live in, in, a, in a world that still experiences brokenness. And today as we gather for worship and we recognize that, that tomorrow is Memorial Day, the day we remember those uh, men and women who have lost their lives in service to our country, uh, we give thanks for them. We give thanks for their families. Uh, we, we pray that, that, uh, 
that, that folks who have lost loved ones that on these, these days, while they're, they're hard to, to, to have those memories, God, that they would also have memories that are filled with joy and with love. And God, we know that, that, um, that when we center ourselves in you and, and we follow you, that that's how you lead us. You lead us into joy and love and to peace and all, those, the, all the fruit of the Spirit. So God, we, we give you thanks. Uh, God, as we seek you this morning, we pray that, that we might find you. We pray that as we leave from this time of worship, that we surely would have experienced your presence in a very profound way. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, and it's in Jesus' name we worship. Amen. I would like to invite you to stand with me and to participate in the responsive reading that will serve as our call to worship. It is printed there in the bulletin, and if you don't have a bulletin, you can see it on the screens. Please stand. Blessed be God, eternal majesty, living word, abiding spirit. Jesus said the way to see God's dream for the world is to be born from above by the Spirit. The way to take part in that dream, says Jesus, is to be born of water and spirit. That gift is available this day. May you receive God's Spirit, be made whole, and dwell more deeply in love divine. Amen. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a grave in the dirt the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. To reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost. To redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering, you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for our sake you died. the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. you rose, all of heaven held its breath, till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death, and the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe, for the word of all who'd come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of all 
shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. morning. Our scripture, reader this mor- scripture reading this morning comes from Romans 8, verses 12 through 17. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So, you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. If all the kids will join me down front. (laughs) We only have one today, so she's a little shy. Thank you for coming, Miss Ivy. We get to go upstairs after, okay? You have a seat. I'm going to read you a verse that we're not going to hear because we're going to go upstairs, but Mr. Graham's going to read it in just a few minutes. But it's an important verse, and I want you to hear it first before we start talking about it. This is John 3, 16. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That is a pretty awesome verse. And when we talk about God's love, that's the verse that we talk about. And I looked it up, and when you want to tell your friend about God, you want to talk about God's love, and that's a pretty easy verse to start with. But when you go to look at other verses, there are two books of the Bible, the Old Testament and the New, or two parts of the Bible, the New Testament and the Old Testament. There are 66 books, 1,189 chapters, and 31,173 verses. That's a lot. Where do you start? Well, you start with John 3, 16. So now we're going to break that verse down. Do you need to hear it again? Do you know that verse fairly well? We're going to learn it today. So it says, God so loved the world that, he, um, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Who's the verse about? I'm going to let not just Ivy, but the whole church can answer. So I help her out a little bit. So who is this verse about? Jesus or who sent his son? God, absolutely. And what does God do? What does he do? Loves. And who does God love? Us, the world. You and me, especially. What did God do to show us his love? He gave us his son. And what must we do in return for God's love? We have to believe that Jesus is God's son. And our reward, what do we get for believing that Jesus is God's son? We get to spend forever 
with God. We get to spend, as long as we accept Jesus as God's son and accept him in our heart, we get to spend eternity forever and ever and ever with God. Even when we die or whatever, we get to spend it with God. And that is what God's love is all about. And that's what we want to share because God's book, his Bible, all the 31,000 verses and 1,100 chapters and two parts and 66 books all talk about how awesome God's love is. And we just have to remember that that's the promise we've been given by God. And that's pretty cool. So let's remember that on mem uh, Memorial Day, that God loved us so much, he gave us his son. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your son. Help us to remember that each and every day with each and every step we take. It's in your name we pray. Good morning again. It's good, good to see everyone. I was told several times uh, this past week by people uh, in the, that I'd see it, it here in Farmville, they would say, Graham, I'm, I'm just so sorry. There's hardly going to be any, anybody there on Sunday. I'm just, just how it's going to be. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? Like, this is like my sweet spot, right, Gina? Like, in 2019, I had a grand slam of low attendance Sundays where I got to preach. I got to do the Memorial Day sermon. I got to do the July 4th Sunday. I got the, uh, the Labor Day Sunday. And then, and then the grand slam that year was that, the, uh, that right, the, the, one, the Sunday that was closest to New Year's was right, right before New Year's. So I, I, look, I'm used to this. I, have, I, mean, I'm not, I, mean, I have an hour-long sermon ready to go for this. Uh, I'm just kidding with you. Just kidding with you. Just kidding with you. Look, apparently there's a, I have the reputation already. Rocky Stone told me the other day at lunch, he was like, yeah, I heard from someone that they said, man, that dude can talk like 45, 46 minutes. Uh, I'm trying to whittle them down, okay? I'm trying to whittle them down, especially as we add more elements to the service. But, um, you know, before, uh, before coming here to First Baptist, I didn't get to preach a whole lot. And so, like, between sermons, there was, like, a whole lot that I wanted to say, and so, yeah, I preached these pretty good, long sermons, and, and one lady came up, she was like, you say, you, you put more words into 36 minutes than some pastors do into three weeks. She said, it's not just 36 minutes of talking, it's like an hour's worth of talking. And, um, but, uh, and, and then this past week, I was talking to my, the, the secretary from Longview, because she's like, uh, she's, she, she always calls me the, the son she never had, and she's Luke and Levi's honorary grandparents. I know they'll have some more honorary grandparents from here, but they were the first ones. And I said, yeah, Kim, it's, it's unbelievable. They let me preach every Sunday. So, um, but I'm just kidding. I'm just, so, so this morning, uh, I'm excited about today's sermon um, and, and the, the passage of Scripture we're going to be in. I'm excited about it because it's a passage of Scripture that we're very familiar with. It's John chapter 3. Verses 1 through 17, it's, it's the, the interchange that Nicodemus and Jesus have. And in fact, Holly just mentioned it, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever ever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. If you go onto the internet and you Google up what's the most popular verse, that's at the top of every single list, right? How many of you rem memorize that at VBS or you were in Sunday school you had to memorize that thing, and if you did, maybe you got a piece of candy, or maybe if it was way back, you just got a pat on the back, right? Nowadays, like, you do that, you get like a whole Easter basket worth of candy, you know. Um, anyway, I had a youth one time, I challenged the youth, I said, I said, I want to challenge you to, to memorize this scripture before next week. And one of the girls came up, she said, if I do it, what do I get? And I said, you get closer with Jesus. She said, I don't want that, I want candy. So, anyway. All right, so we're going to be in John 3, 16, uh, John 3, and we're going to look at John 3, 16. And the title of my sermon is called Believes Might Not Be the Best Word for It. Believes Might Not Be the Best Word for It. We'll get to that part. But first, let's start in the beginning. We see here that a guy named Nicodemus comes to Jesus to have a conversation. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. Uh, a member of the powerful Jewish governing body called the Sanhedrin. And he, you know, these guys had been watching Jesus, and they didn't like Jesus because Jesus wasn't coming back in the ways that they thought that Jesus, or Jesus wasn't coming to them in the ways that they thought the Messiah was going to come. And so, uh, but they couldn't deny what they were witnessing. 
Nicodemus had seen Jesus perform signs and miracles and wonders, and he recognized him as a person that God had sent. But to avoid being seen by others, seen by his peers, he comes to Jesus in the dark. Let's pick up with John chapter 3, verse 1. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. So we have this guy who's, you know, he's, he's one who wants to, and the Pharisees were known as these people who wanted to be seen in the daylight, seen by all as these people who were religious uh, experts, these people who were on a higher religious plane than everyone else. Jesus would say that they would go and they, they, when they were fasting, they would put on a, a show so that they would be seen by others to be seen as being religious. They loved being seen and being recognized for the things that they were doing. Yet we see time and time again these Pharisees, uh, th- there was a level of insecurity that they had because they realized that all the stuff they were doing didn't make them any closer to God. Nicodemus recognizes that and he comes to Jesus in the dark. He comes to Jesus so he's not seen by his peers. He comes to Jesus because he do, in, in the dark because he doesn't want to, to others to recognize any insecurities that he may have. You see, people who have questions about the spiritual world will often ask those questions, just not in a religious setting. How many of you have ever had a question about God or maybe a doubt about something or you're struggling with something and you're in a in a Bible study on a Sunday morning, and that's just not the right time to bring it up. <laughs> How many of us have had conversations with people out, out in, in, in the city, out in the community, maybe in a backyard, and in the midst of those conversations, that's when those questions come up. Or maybe it's among people who don't profess to be Christians when, we're fi- when we finally utter the doubt that we have or the thing that we're struggling with. I think we have to be careful and we have to recognize that the setting that Nicodemus was in with these other religious leaders was one that he didn't feel comfortable or safe enough to bear his soul and be himself. So he comes to Jesus in the dark. He comes shielded with no daylight to, 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 to show other people who he is because he feels that he'll be, he'll be judged for that. He comes to Jesus under the cover of night. And, he go, and then Jesus has this, uh, he, and he asks him a question. He says, Rabbi, we know uh, that you're a, a teacher uh, who has come from God, for, or he makes a statement, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you're doing if God were not with him. And then Jesus says, uh, he replies, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Okay? Okay. Um, I was reading as I was doing the research on this, uh, some scholars think that this is almost like, you know, you know, Jesus often asks a lot of questions, and we don't have a question mark on the end of verse 3, but they say that there's questions all over it. That Jesus almost asks a riddle to Nicodemus. And we see that the way that Nicodemus deals with what Jesus says in verse 3, that very truly no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. The way that he deals with it is he says... Uh, um, uh, how can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. You can just see the wheels turning in Nicodemus' mind, right? Because for him, following God was not about being born again. We were born one time and then we need to do a bunch of good things to earn God's favor. Remember, we talked about last week on Pentecost Sunday that the Holy Spirit, there was a shift in the work of the Holy Spirit from the Old Testament to the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit, God would send upon a person for a special task or based on someone's merit or the good things they did, the Holy Spirit might be involved in their lives. The Holy Spirit's very different than the work of the Holy Spirit after Jesus uh, was uh, crucified and then resurrected and ascended and then sent the Spirit into the lives of of believers. Part of that is because that when God looks at us now in Jesus Christ, he doesn't see us as sinners. Even if you even if you commit a sin right now, Jesus still sees you as the saint. 
because we're covered by Jesus. And so, to put ourselves back into that frame of mind, Nicodemus is asking the question, how, how am I going to get back inside my mom to get born again? Therein lies a, something we don't see. Um, if you go back to the original language, the Greek, the word again comes from the Greek word anothen. And it has a two-part meaning. It means again, and it also means from above. So if, if you look in your, if you have a Bible that has little references and everything, um, go and, and look at verse 3. Okay, my translation that I'm using is the NIV, and it says, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Some translations say, though, unless they are born from above. But Nicodemus doesn't hear from above. Nicodemus here is being born again. Isn't it funny that the language we use to ask people if they're saved by Jesus actually comes from a misunderstanding of what Jesus says? When I was reading that this week, I was like, wow. that's." Uh, I mean, but we are born again when we're in Jesus. But it doesn't look like what Nicodemus thinks that, that, that it does. Nicodemus thinks that he, can, that he can somehow use physical power to get back in a womb and be born again, and all of you women are like, this is just crazy what Nicodemus is thinking, but he's a desperate guy who realizes that the religious system is, is not working for him, and then this Jesus is talking about being born a second time, but Jesus actually is talking about a different kind of birth. Jesus is talking about a birth that comes from above that we can't manipulate, that we can only be gifted Verse 5, Jesus says, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. And then Jesus says this, you're Israel's teacher and do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we've seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? Nicodemus had a mind block. He couldn't wrap his mind around what Jesus was coming into this earth to do. In their minds, the, the, the religious leaders, the religious people, had it all figured out exactly, exactly what it was going to look like. And they thought that based on their merit, based on their good works, the kingdom of God was going to come. And it was never going to be like that. How many of us, let me just ask the question, I hadn't planned to ask the question, but the question is there. How many of us have a vision? How many of us have a Hope for our church, for our community, for our families. And we think that it's going to come about if we just read the right book. If we just have the right five steps program. If our church just has the, the right this or that or that or that. But maybe God is saying that it can't be born like that. Something that is sustainable can't come like that. It has to be born of the Spirit not born of the will of flesh. That's a whole other conversation. Like a, that's like a meeting where we have questions. And, but think about that. What are you trying to do? What, what are you hoping that's going to happen in your life? But it's not going to happen like that. It has to be born. Maybe at the end of the sermon I have an illustration that will bring that home. I, I think it, it would help me. To enter and participate... In the kingdom of God, people must be born again, and it's a spiritual rebirth, a work of God, and not religious manipulation. The interchange continues. Jesus goes on in verse 13, No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. And he's talking about himself. 14, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in Him. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, 
but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. So Jesus is continuing to teach Nicodemus what this new birth is like. To teach Nicodemus that it's not based on your religious works, but it's this gift that comes from above. And then he uses, he references something that happened way back in their past that he would know about. We don't have the scripture listed, but if you want to just listen to me as, as I read it this morning, if we go all the way back into Numbers chapter 21, where the nation of Israel was continuing to wander, they were continuing to disobey God. Remember, they, they, they escaped um, from the Pharaoh's grip. Um, they went across the Red Sea. They were out in the desert. They ended up wandering for 40 years, not because God planned for them to be there for 40 years, but it took 40 years for them to finally get it together. And how many, how many, I see a pastor on the back, how many times do we reference this, right, that we, Pastor Rick, that, you know, in, in churches and in different places, like, we got to be careful, y'all, that we don't just wonder and wonder and wonder and wonder and wonder, and, and, because 40 years is a long time, yet 40 years can pass by for the nation of Israel in a flash. So here in, in Numbers chapter 21, we have in the midst of their wandering, basically the pattern was this. They would trust God. They trusted God when they were in Egypt, when Israel was released. They were trusting God when those waves were parted, the waters were parted in the Red Sea, and they crossed over. They were trusting God. And then they got over there. Y'all remember what happened? They started complaining Started, they, they started thinking, oh, we had it better when we were slaves. They wanted to go back. We couldn't, you know, what you say, they can't, you can't get the, the um, what well, you can't get the country, what's, the, what's the, 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 in, in the south, we call it, you can't get the, you can get the girl out of the country or the guy out of the country, but you can't get the country out of the girl or the guy. You ever heard that before? So, like, we, we could get the nation of Israel out of Egypt, but we couldn't get, it took a while to get Egypt out of them. They go out into the, the reason that they wanted to es escape Slavery in Egypt was because every day they were slaves. Seven days a week, every day. They didn't get a break. They didn't get a time to worship God. So they're going after these things. They're trusting God in the process. God leads them to a place that's not the promised land yet, but it's a transitory place, a place where they're going to move through if they trust him. But they end up spending 40 years and they're not trusting God, trusting him a little bit, not trusting him. And this is just one of the examples Okay, Numbers chapter 21 verse 4 says that they traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient. How many of y'all have ever been on a trip somewhere and you're just like, can we ever get there? Kids yelling and screaming, can we ever get there? The kids, now we've got TV screens we can put up for uh, kids to watch them. I know some of y'all are like, why didn't we have TVs in our cars when, we were, when our kids were young? Um, so people grew impatient. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Okay, God gave them quail and manna every day to eat. Okay, imagine if... Imagine if, like, every day you walked outside of your tent, you're, you're on this journey, God's leading you somewhere, and, like, there's, there's every day there's what you need to eat is right there. Like, it's like the, you know, like, the, the, do they do, the, the grocery stores deliver food here in Farm? Have we ever had that, like, the delivery? I don't know. We get that sometimes, the Instacart. Any of you ladies know? Yeah, so you can get food delivered to you. Imagine if that just showed up to your doorstep every day. You didn't have to pay for it. You didn't have to go hunt and forage for it. You just had to go up and pick it up and eat it. A miracle. It, what, what would it be like, though, for the miracle to become something that happens so often you just take it for granted and start complaining about the miracle? This shows us here the nation of Israel's mindset. There's, they're complaining about God's work in their lives. And then it says in verse 6, then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. So I have a lot of questions. Just to let you know as a pastor, as your pastor, about verse 6. And I've had, I think, a few conversations with people here about whether God sent, really did send snakes to bite people and kill them, or whether in their, 
and they're complaining and spending too much time in the desert. They just happened to be in a place where there were venomous snakes that were biting them and killing them. You know, like, I think, like, if, like, Gina and I have children, obviously, we talk about them a lot, I bring them up a lot, um, and, and we have to discipline them, right? Amen? Yeah. Uh, so we, got, we have to discipline them. And imagine if you could put yourself back when you were being disciplined by your parents. Um, imagine if you were writing the story of it, okay? When, like, you know, let's say that Luke pushes Levi down, and then, you know, and it's like, a, like he was just so mean, this is like the last straw, we got to go put Luke in time out and also get a spank. And he's just in his room. He's mad. And he's writing the story, the, narr- the, the narrative of what just happened. Okay? He's not going to paint me as a loving father who's teaching him how to behave in the world. He's going pa- to paint the picture of me being this wrathful father who loves spanking his kids and putting him in time out. You see, some... I've talked to people who see the scriptures as like, you know, God in heaven has a printing press and he got all the words and put them together with, you know, the little, in my Bible it has little blue headings and got some leather, killed some cows, put the leather binding and then had some nice ribbon in heaven, put it in it and just dropped it like air mailed it, like Amazon primed it to the world. And, um, And for me that cheapens it so much. The way I see the scriptures and the way many people I respect see the scriptures is as God's work among people who are imperfect and his spirit inspiring them to write words that continue to guide people in faith. So the words are dynamic. The words are alive. The words are able to be studied and understood. It's not, it's not so simple. It's actually more complex and beautiful. I hadn't really talked, planned on going it there, but it's here in the text. And I know we're far away from, from John, but we'll, we'll get back there. When it says that the Lord sent venomous snakes among them and they bit the people and many, many Israelites died, my wonder is, did God really send those or, or in their disobedience, their continued year after year disobedience, 40 years in the desert of disobedience, did they just happen to be there in their disobedience? And and God was saying, this is what you get. I think in the whole of the scripture, that's a more accurate understanding of what's happening there. But this is what happens. The vipers are uh, killing the people. The people come to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. You've heard the story before? Yeah, so if you ever see an ambulance, look at the ambulance. You'll see, a bronze, you'll see the pole with a snake wrapped around it. it. It's a sign for healing. So they pray. They, they realize in their disobedience they were where they were. The snakes were killing people. They needed God for help. So God sends them something, a, a snake on a pole. So imagine that you're encamped with a few thousand of your closest friends and, and relatives. And you're in the, in the desert. And people are dying. There's snakes coming out from the sand and biting people and killing them. Yet there is a cure. There's a pole, a bronze pole with a bronze snake wrapped around it. And if you get bit... All you have to do is look at it and you live. What's your life going to be like? Your life is going to revolve around the snake on a pole. It doesn't matter where you're at. You're going to make sure that there's not a tent in your way in case you get bit by a snake so that you can look on that snake, that bronze snake on the pole and live, right? I mean, we want to live, right? So... It doesn't matter where you're at. If you're hanging out with, with, with your friends and y'all are you know, having a Saturday night cookout, at, at, eating some quail and manna at the, um, at the tent that's a quarter mile away, you're going to make sure that you have a window of the tent open so that you can see the, sna- the snake on the pole and live. That's just how, that's just how you're going to orient your life. And Jesus tells Nicodemus uh, in, um, in verse... uh, Verse 14, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The definition for the word believes, Jesus just gave. 
and in verse 14 and 15. You see, today we, uh, I think that, that the way that we interact with the word believe and believing in Jesus oversimplifies what believing actually is. We see the definition of believe is to accept something as true or to feel sure of truth or to hold something as an opinion or to think or suppose something. Did you hear, you hear that? Let me do that one more time. The definition of believe is this, to accept something as true, to feel sure of the truth, or to hold something as an opinion, think or suppose something. Okay? Basically, it's intellectual assent about something that is true. Okay, so we do believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and that's a starting place. But we also believe things like gravity, right? How many of you wakes up in the morning and you pray to gravity to hold you to the floor when you stand out of the bed? You don't have to do that. It's going to happen, right? I mean, it kept you in the bed, hopefully, and if you roll too close to the edge, it made you fall out of the bed. But no, none of us wakes up and we're just like, I need to really lean into gravity today. We, we've intellectually ascended. We understand it's there. Other, another example, and, and there are many of these. I'm just going to give one more. Think about uh, the laws of, of the road, okay? We believe that there are laws of the road that are there to govern people as they drive, to keep them safe, and to get them where they're going, to make things work well together, right? But some of us, when we're late, we break those laws and go a little fast, right? Or if we're, if we're coming up on, and it, the, the lights turn yellow, but we just think we might... We might Actually, accidentally go through a little red light there. There are many things that we believe in, yet they don't truly affect the way we live. And so I, as I studied the book of John, and I went through and tried to find other places where it talked about what it is, this relationship that we have with God, it begins with belief. It does. But that's not where it ends. Believes isn't the best word for it. And John doesn't only say that the relationship that we have with Jesus is belief. He says that Jesus is God. He says Jesus is the word or the logos or the, the, the reasoning, the intellect of God. He says that Jesus is the lamb. He says that Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the door. Jesus is the good shepherd. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. Jesus is the true vine, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Believes might not be the best word, but it is how it starts. But if we believe in Jesus, the definition is not just that we believe like he's that snake on the pole and we believe he's there. We actually, we actually organize our life all around him. We trust in him. We hope in him. We depend upon him. We center our lives upon Jesus. We see that Nicodemus, he doesn't have a response here. Jesus actually, in verse 17, and then he actually continues through 21, but verse 17 is where our reading ends. You see that he says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. There's supposed to be an M on the end of that. To save the world through him. And then he goes on and he talks about how, uh, verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of, the, of God's Son, his one and only Son. He goes through and he actually addresses what I mentioned earlier about the nation of Israel and the snakes coming upon them and saying that God actually doesn't con come to condemn people. They've done that already. They've worked themselves in that already. God came to save people. And so Nicodemus' response isn't like, well, I'm going to walk the aisle right now. Baptize me. I'm getting saved. It's actually, for him, it's, it's a gradual response. We see that later in John chapter 7, verse 50 through 52, that when this movement of Jesus, this messianic movement starts taking root and really upsetting a lot of the Pharisees, that he defends Jesus in, the front of other Pharise in front of other Pharisees. And then in John chapter 19, after Jesus has been killed on the cross, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus prepare his body for, for burial. The ultimate act of him coming into this 
faith and trust of this messianic movement. And think about him doing that at a time where Jesus hasn't come back to life. Jesus' lifeless body is there, but Nicodemus has realized that, that following the path of this guy that they just killed is actually more fruitful than following the path of just religious goods and services. Think about that. He's made a decision to follow Jesus before Jesus even came back and proved that he's worth following. That he's actually the end of death, crying, mourning, pain. That he's actually the beginning. He hadn't seen the proof of Jesus rising from the dead yet, yet he's centered his life in him. In the rainforest of Olympic National Park in Washington State stands groves of towering trees, the source of whose life is not visible. Yet if you study it, you can figure out how it happened. You see, the roots of these trees, they fan out uh, like, like the ribs of an umbrella. Picture these towering trees, but then around them, the roots aren't hidden under the ground. The roots are actually over the ground, such that wind can pass under the roots. You see, these trees were given birth by nurse logs. Nurse logs are fallen trees, and they are left to lie on the earth until they crumble into a dust. But right before they crumble into a dust that is blown away and disintegrate, something else transpires. A seed falls on the down log, draws nourishment from the log, even as that log continues to decay. And then roots begin to grow and ultimately surround an empty space through which that wind blows and that tree grows up. It's the wonderful illustration of what happens in our lives when we're born again, when we choose to follow Jesus. We have to lay our lives down and choose to follow Him, believe in Him, lean upon Him, trust in Him, depend upon Him, center our lives in Him. And as we do that, that old self, like that nurse log, crumbles, disintegrates, blows away, and what's left are beautiful roots through which the wind blows. We see in the scriptures that the Holy Spirit is many times referred to as the wind of God. Our family is currently experiencing a lot of answered prayers. I've shared, we've shared with some of you guys that um, two, two weeks ago, I preached a sermon right here about, was, the title of it was called Good Bones. Y'all remember that? And I said, I can't wait at some point for Gina and I to stand in a house around this area and say, it's got good bones, you know, our future home. Little did I know that later, a few, just a few days later, that that would become a possibility. And last Sunday, we became under contract on the house here in Farmville. I spent Monday and Tuesday working my tail off trying to get our house ready to be on the market. It went on the market on Thursday, and by yesterday at lunchtime, it was under contract. Gina has several uh, answers to prayers for jobs that are happening right now. And um, God is answering so many prayers. So many things are falling into place. But I had a conversation this past week with one of my neighbors about this. She was walking her dog, and I stopped, and I had all three of our dogs in the back, and they were just howling, so it was, it was pretty chaotic. But we were trying to have this conversation. And she was like, it is so crazy how God is just, is just doing all these things. And I told her, I said, it, 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 is, it is amazing. And it is so, it is so humbling to, to have these things happening. But I told her, I said, but, but the reason they're happening is because we stood firm in the times that those things weren't happening. This is a season where God is, ask, is answering a lot of prayers, but three, four, five years ago, there were seasons when we had these hopes, we were praying these prayers, and we didn't see answers. Seven years ago, when I was ministering at a church that was, we were doing great things, but all of a sudden the money started drying up, and the church couldn't afford to continue having several staff, and I was one of the ones that didn't have a place there anymore. We had a decision to make. We had a decision to make. Will we depend on the flesh and on the elements of this world, or would we lean in and depend upon Jesus? And we chose the latter. We chose Jesus. 
I, I told him, I said, it, it's, it's fun to be in this season, but the fruit of this season were seeds that were planted in seasons that were really tough to be in. Seeds that were planted, planted maybe in a drought. And this isn't, a, this isn't because we were perfect during those times, but we, we were repentant. We tried our best to follow Jesus. We, we loved each other, supported each other. And the places that we were at, the church that we were at, I told y'all I did the Grand Slam of low attendance Sundays. I brought my best. I brought my best. I didn't roll the ball to the plate. I threw a fastball. I led people to Jesus. Did my best. When, when Gina was, when, when people in the church, you know, we, we need to recognize that, that it's hard on families when they're raising young children. It just is. And so Gina's part of her ministry for our family, especially when we were at Longview a lot you know, during that time and our kids were real little, a big part of her ministry was taking care of our kids while I was at church. And I remember there were, there were some people who said, well, we're, you were worried about Gina not being visible enough. And I'm thinking, do you know how hard it is? Do you remember how difficult it was? And you're not volunteering to serve in the nursery. We don't have a nursery during this time. So she wants to bring the kids up here and have them screaming. And then it's going to two hours past their bedtime. We trusted what we were doing. And my ministry was just as important as the ministry that this young lady on the front row was in. And so we planted those seeds. We watered those seeds when it was tough. We allowed ourselves to not trust in the flesh, but to trust in the new birth because we knew that the new birth was the only way that would lead to life. So let me ask you, what's the nurse log in your life right now that you need to plant seeds in? I believe that if, we, that if we don't just believe that Jesus is there, but we lean into Jesus, we trust him as the word, we trust him as the lamb of God, the bread of life, the light of the world, the door, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth and the life, the true vine, the Christ, the very son of God, and not just something that we have to intellectually ascend to, but something, a person that we center our lives around, that he will blow our minds with what grows. Let us pray. Father, we are so thankful. We are so thankful that, that, you are, that you are a loving God that has chosen to participate in a relationship with the people that you've created. Well, we are blessed by your presence with us, and we are blessed that, that, that Jesus willingly died on that cross to become that, that serpent wrapped around a pole that would give us healing, that would give us forgiveness, that would allow us to stand before you, not as a sinner, but as a saint and as children beloved. God, my prayer is that anyone in this space or hearing online right now, Lord, that if we haven't trusted you with our lives, that we would do so, that we would look upon you and not just believe but God, that we would commit and devote ourselves to following Jesus and find healing. God, I believe that you're continuing to plant seeds in people's lives, continuing to plant seeds in our church, and we pray that as we trust you with those things, that we would realize that it's not, it, it's not based on us trying to be smarter. I mean, we should try to be smart, but God, if we don't trust you uh, in your spirit's work, Lord, that we're going to fail. So help us to do that. Help us to, to learn from the early church to devote ourselves to the scriptures, to devote ourselves to prayer, to devote ourselves uh, to those spiritual disciplines, to devote ourselves to being together as the body, to bearing each other's burdens, to praying with one another, to lifting each other up in prayer, to, 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 to spending the time that it takes to actually understand where other people are at in life and to be able to speak words of truth to each other of encouragement, of challenge. Lord, we thank you for the work that you're doing in and through us. And we pray that we'll see beautiful things. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.
carry the light. Go and tell the children they are precious in His sight. Carry the light. Carry the light. Go and preach the gospel. Jesus Christ, carry the light. Count them by the millions, blinded slaves to sin. Inside they are dying. Jesus loves them, and his heart is breaking. Carry the light, carry the light, go and tell the children. Precious in His sight, carry the light, carry the light, go and preach the gospel till there is no more night in the name of Jesus Christ. Carry in his sight carry the light carry the light go and preach the gospel till there is no more night in the name of Jesus Christ carry worship time and leading us this morning. We appreciate that. Remember, next Sunday will be our graduate recognition Sunday, and so uh, uh, make sure you share that with, with other folks. Make sure we're here to, to uh, give them a lot of encouragement and send them off well and tell them to come back too. So, uh, uh, but anyway, we're, we'll be uh, celebrating Kenley as well uh, as many others. So I will invite you to stand with me as we uh, end this time of worship. Again, Father, we are so thankful for today. We're thankful for the ways you encourage us. We're thankful that we can come to you just like Nicodemus, that we can ask questions that we don't understand. And you're patient with us. You teach us. And we, we thank you that, uh, that you're all, always leading us on this journey if we're, if we're listening to you. We do thank you for this Memorial Day weekend that we're able to celebrate. And let us not take for granted the sacrifices 
that have been made and to reach out to those who we know that the sacrifices have affected greatly. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. In Jesus' name we go. Amen. Thank you.